Good evening, everybody, and Happy New Year. Welcome to Reasonable Doubt, brought to you by the Harris County Criminal Lawyers Association. I'm Jimmy Ardwan, along with my co-host, Julio Vela. Julio, welcome to 2018, my friend. Oh, it's a 2018 came roaring in. It's feeling real good, Jimmy. 2018's here. We're it's only four coming days real in, nice. man. <laughs> we got 348 days to 361. go. 361. Three six, thank you for that. Your math is close. You know, you know, whatever. We're only four it's, days in, man. You look like you've been put through the ringer with, no, look, with Mike Tyson. 2018 is done. 2019 is going to be my year. <laughs> you've already, four days in, you've already said 2018 is done. You know, I'll tell you, whatever I'm putting up with is nothing compared to these guys. No, no, no. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, a special panel for you. Um, our first panel of the year is going to be three judicial candidates all from the Democratic side. And before I introduce them, I want to let you know they, they are all running for county criminal court at law number five here in Harris County. Uh, this is all three of the candidates that are, are running for the Democratic nomination. We are going to, just so everybody knows, because I know we've had uh, a couple <laughs> Democratic candidates on, uh, we are trying to secure the Republican side as well. Um, we are hoping to line up between now and the primary. When's the primary? March? March, Sixth. I believe. Yeah. March 6th. So uh, between now and then, we hope to have not just the Democratic candidates uh, for all of these <coughs> benches or as many benches as we can squeeze in. I think we have like nine shows between now and the primary. So we're going to get try and get as many of the candidates from both parties and as many benches as we can on between now and then. But uh, for tonight, let me introduce our panel. Sitting to my left, Armin Merjanian. Good evening. Good How are you? Hi, Jimmy. Thank Armin you for joining. Yeah, yep. thanks. Armin the Hammer, right? Yeah, Armin, Armin Hammer. Hammer. That's how you go by? That's, that's your nickname? That's it. Okay. Well, I mean, that'll be good. You can use that gavel. You can put the hammer on it or something. That's right. <laughs> Although Jim Adler might get a little mad. He's the Texas Hammer. That's true. I'm just that's true. Armin Hammer. That's right. There you go. <laughs> In the middle, Aaron Saldana. How's Aaron, it going, Jimmy? Thanks for joining us tonight. I appreciate it. Thanks for the invite. Uh, you bet. You bet. Anytime. And on the end next to Julio, David Fleischer. David. Hi. How are you? Program. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we are going to be here for the next hour, ladies and gentlemen, talking with the three Democratic candidates. We will open up the phone lines probably about halfway through, 8.30 or so. 713-807-1794 um, is the number. I also have Twitter up right here, so you can shoot me any questions or comments at HCCLA underscore TV, and we'll read them right here on the air. Uh, guys, it's, so we got a little less than... 90 days here, or about 90 days, I guess, to the to the primary. Um, what are some of the issues that y'all have seen out on the campaign trail uh, that people are voicing to you? Armin? Anybody, take the sure. question. What are the issues that y'all see? Sure, so, <clears throat> Jimmy, yeah. I've, been, uh, I've been asked a lot about what are my thoughts about the bail reform lawsuit going mm -hmm. on right now. And I know that's a big thing for you. It's a big thing, yeah. In fact, I, that prompted you to run from, from what I can uh, gather. I did a little bit of research on okay. that. Okay. So, yeah. and, I, and, I, and I understand that that is what prompted you uh, to run for this position. It was one of the things that prompted me. There were several different things prompted me, uh, including the current sitting bench, uh, the judge on the bench. But, uh, yeah, the bail reform lawsuit, I mean, it's, it's a... a I don't understand why Harris County has spent over $4 million defending an uh, indefensible lawsuit. They know they're in the wrong. 15 of the 16 judges know they're wrong, but yet they continue to uh, defend a system where they continue to jail the poor and get uh, potentially innocent people to plead guilty to crimes they may not have committed just to regain their freedom. And uh, that's wrong. How much of an issue, David and Aaron, have you guys seen out on the campaign trail with regard to the, the bail reform lawsuit? Has that been a big issue that you, you guys have been asked about? I haven't so much been asked about that too much. Um, it's the understanding that many people that I've talked to is that um, since the ruling came out, at least the people that are somewhat in the know and know what's going on in the judicial system, they they tell me that aren't they getting more PR bonds? Aren't there? It's not as much of a plea mill as it used to be because on top of the more PR bonds that they're receiving from judges, um, accused defendants are actually also receiving unsecured bonds from the sheriff's office. So I don't think it's as much as an issue of it being as much of a plea mill as it has been referred to as a past mm -hmm. um, because I think they're trying to work some something out, but I agree with Armin. At, at this point, with the ruling that's come out, I don't understand why they're still funneling money into it when it's indefensible at this point, and with the ruling that came out, they're already being released 
um, as far as nonviolent offenders are concerned, whether it be by judges granting a PR bond or then being released through the sheriff's office. Yeah. David, you know, there's there's been some news articles and some postings on social media by uh, Chris Daniel, our district clerk, and by others about the statistics uh, and, and, and about how certain people uh, who get these PR bonds, uh, they come in and, and how the percentage that are actually forfeited. Um, and uh, it's, what was it, 46% or something right. like that, I think somewhere in there. Um, I, I mean, what are, what are you seeing, are, are people, are the people out on the campaign trail actually believing those numbers? Are they are they concerned that there is a safety issue there with with PR bonds? What are what are you guys hearing out on the road about that? Well, first off, statistics can be very can be manipulated very easily. Thirty five percent of people know that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> all the time. Right. So I think that people just want to be educated. They don't know what's going on and. When I'm out there and when I'm talking to people, I'm talking to people who aren't in the criminal justice system. They don't know what's going on. So what I try to do is I try to educate them. You know, I've been licensed for 13 years. This process, the way that it's been, it's been like this for a long time. And while I'm not saying it's bad, I'm not saying it's good, what's nice is it's the way things are going now because I think a lot of people are getting out now who would never have been able to get out. And it's nice, because now people can actually fight their case, they can do um, what they want to do, and they can do it without being fear of, God, I'm gonna have to stay in jail 30 days, am I gonna have to just sit this out? Or plead guilty just to get out. You know, I've done, you know, I've represented a lot of appointed people as well, and, and you know, there are times when I represent people who I tell them, no, let's fight your case. Nope, I just want to plead guilty. I want to get out. No matter what I do, no matter what I say, they are going to want to plead guilty regardless. But now it's nice because I, I tell them, hey, just hold on. I'll get you a bond. And, and it's, it's, it's great. It's been happening. So I think that now on the campaign trail, what I've been doing is I've been just trying to educate people and let them know, okay, well, uh, people don't believe numbers. I mean, anybody can put numbers to paper, and, and how do we know that's actually true? I, I think, if I remember correctly, Chris Daniel put some numbers on the paper, and then he had to come back and correct it because it was incorrect. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think it was a big disparity, too. I don't think it was something small. I think, I, I don't know exactly, so I don't want to say what yeah. the numbers and what the disparity was, but I know that there was a mistake and he had to come back and correct it. So I don't really put any kind of val validity in the any numbers. I just, I just try to educate the public about what's going on. If, okay, so we all know that people are getting, for nonviolent non offenses and, and for individuals who can't afford their bond, they're either getting a PR bond or they're getting an unsecured bond. Now, we have had individuals where they get out on a PR bond, they, uh, they pick up a new law violation, they pick up a, a, another DWI, they get out on a bond again, they get in to pick up another DWI, they get on bond again, they pick up another DWI. I had a guy today, um, he, he picked up a trespass, he got a PR bond, picked up, uh, get, picked up another trespass, got an unsecured bond, picked up another trespass, got an unsecured bond, picked up another trespass, got another unsecured bond, and finally, somebody got to see him in actually talk to him before he was able to bond out and then bond forfeit again or pick up a new case. Okay, that's a problem. That's a problem. Or is it? Or is it not? I mean, the idea that everybody should be getting PR bonds and or unsecured bonds, uh, is it good or is it bad? And what do you think about this obvious uh, issue? Maybe it's a flaw, maybe it's not, but... I tend to kind of think that's a problem because finally someone was able to talk to this guy after picking up three or four cases and he hadn't been able to see anybody because he'd been able to be bonded out before anybody could speak to him and before anybody could speak to him again he would pick up a new case and then again and again and again. So what are your thoughts on that? Sure. What are I'll, your thoughts? I'll go ahead and take this yeah. one. Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. and. Uh, you know, I've had a lot of people talk to me about this. Uh, one of my mentors, Cynthia Henley, actually, um, she brought this to my attention. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, we're talking 
about misdemeanors and misdemeanors in the state of Texas, that, that they're petty crimes, right? Um, they're petty crimes and the default should be freedom while you fight your case. That should be the default, okay? Uh, and so people, even though they're picking up criminal trespass after criminal trespass after criminal trespass, need to realize that they are still petty crimes. And most of the time, they're victimless crimes. Um, but at some point, they need to answer to the accusations that they're being accused with. So, and that's where the lawyer should come in, whether he has an appointed lawyer or he retains a lawyer, that's where they come into court and that's where they um, handle the cases on their behalf. I mean, I had a case down in Fort Bend County. Uh, it was a lady, she picked up seven theft cases back to back to back to back. Now, she bonded out on all of them, but at the end of the day, we were able to resolve all six or seven of her cases together all at once. So simply because they're bond forfeiting or not showing up, eventually it's gonna catch up with them. Right. Eventually they're gonna come to court with their lawyer and it's gonna be handled. So I think people need to be patient and realize these are misdemeanors, these are petty crimes. If these were felonies or even violent misdemeanors, you know, I think you, would, you might take a different approach, but the norm should be freedom, right? In, while waiting for your trial, waiting for your day in court. And so I don't see it as much of an issue as you do, JV. That's, that's just where I come from. Well, I, I brought it up. Doesn't mean I think it's an issue. Sure. Me personally, I think it's about time because for the last 20 years, all these people were just getting locked up and pleading guilty. And so now we got a reverse system. And I know, I know for myself, and I, I don't know about you guys, but my bond docket is exploding out of control for misdemeanors. And we're about to set 50, 80 misdemeanors. I'm about to set about, about 100 of these misdemeanors uh, ready to go because all these guys now are out on bond and they're not pleading guilty to get out like they used to be. Right. Um, I don't know, but have you all seen a difference between, I mean, June, July, well, but that, then now? Yeah, but that begs the question, JV. I mean, here you are setting 100 cases for um, for trial. One of the things that over the 13 years that I've been practicing um, that, that I've seen is that judges constantly harp on what our docket numbers are, okay? Um, and, and, and look, I, I'm, I know that, that you guys are, are candidates and, and, and maybe your stance on that changes once you take the bench. I mean, we can all sit here and say, oh, I'm never going to look at my numbers, but you don't know what it's like until you actually sit in that seat. But my, my concern is that that's an argument for, for those who, you know, will say, look, well, this is just going to clog up the courts. The, our inability to move cases. Uh, we now don't have a, yeah. an ability to move cases. Who cares? I agree. Who cares? But, but, I mean, but there look, are those who are going to say look, that to justice you, delayed is justice denied, right? If Wrong. If out, okay. To answer your question, I think that what is the purpose of a bond? To secure the release uh, and, and return to court. To get them to come back. Correct. But also, I think it's public safety as well. Sure. So I think that you're... you're it's a two-pronged... Why is a bond public safety? Because that's not what the Constitution says. Well, no, the Constitution is, is to secure them to come back. But yeah, so where the is this current administration, of... and one of right. the reasons one of the judges is re are retiring now is because they're saying, hey, you know, with all these people getting out, well, there goes public safety. You know, and um, I think that's something, you want to get them back, and I think that if you do have them post-bond, maybe they will consider not doing something that would uh, enable them to pick up another case. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I, um, if I may, I tend to fall kind of in the middle, I guess, of what these two guys have said. Um, the purpose of the Bell lawsuit, I thought, and the way I see it is so that poor people were not disadvantaged when it came to having the right to have their liberties protected, so they're released. But it comes to a point where if they keep on committing crime after crime after crime or not showing up to court, um, and if they continue to get unsecured bonds, which has nothing to do, or very limited, it has very little to do with the judges. An unsecured bond is done by the sheriff's department. At some point, there needs to be a roundtable discussion. I don't know exactly what that point would be, but at some point, while they are petty misdemeanors, at some point, they need to come to a resolution to all their cases and they can't just keep on being released, released because the original, 
the original case when they're being released is so that the poor are not disadvantaged. But when they continue to com commit more crimes, they're no, they're no longer being jailed for being poor, but it's for violating the bond condition in the first place by picking up a new case or by failing to return the, to court. So it's a different reason as to why they're being held. It's no longer just <coughs> because they're poor. Hmm. If I could chime in. Yeah, really what did you talk So I want to preface this answer with, I think, any of us three would do a much better job on the bench than the current uh, judge that's sitting on the bench. I just want to make that very clear. But I, I disagree with David. I, I disagree in the fact that uh, bonds are for public safety. I don't, personally, I don't even feel it's, it's the judge should play a role in public safety. That's not what the judiciary's job is, uh, JV. Uh, the, there's three branches to the government. Everyone who went to high school in the United States knows this. There's the executive branch, the judiciary branch, and then the legislative branch. It's the executive branch, right, the police, the prosecutors, the president, to enforce the laws of the United States. And they're the ones <coughs> responsible with protecting the public. The judiciary is to be an unbiased, neutral arbitrator, if you will, who hears both sides and who and who decides to do what is best uh, given the facts of the case and given the law. And then the, it's the legislator to create these laws to ensure that the uh, police and prosecutors are enforcing. So uh, I, I, I don't I don't believe the bail should be a way to keep people in jail to prevent them from committing more crimes because if somebody had all the money in the world, or just a rich person, right. or just an above average person, they'll just pay that $500 bond or that $5,000 bond, get out and do the same thing again. And you know what? Whatever, they'll go back in jail, and then they'll pay more money and more money. So really what's happening is we're punishing the poor for being poor, and that is not right. That's it. End of story. One of the things that I've seen, at least from uh, pre-suit and, and post-suit, is, okay, so... We used to have clients who'd commit a trespass, they'd get a time served and get out, and then we'd still see them next week, and then they'd get a time served and get out, and then we'd see them next week, and then they'd get a time served and get out. Now, now what's happening it, for some is they're getting a PR bond, getting out, unsecured bond, getting out, unsecured bond, getting out, unsecured. So um, it didn't... Uh, I didn't see a big, I, I keep seeing the same people and, I, and it's just that now they're on bond and now we can fight the case. And they're getting through this, in other words, they're, they're getting through this system as they normally would anyways, but now they're getting through it without picking up five, six, seven, eight convictions uh, back to back to back to back to back. So what I think is going to have to happen is um, the district attorney's office is going to have to start thinking about and making better decisions as to what cases they're going to start prosecuting and whether or not certain cases are worth it and whether or not certain cases uh, uh, justify spending uh, taxpayer resources. Absolutely. So going on, on, on that end about people on bonds, about, uh, about the role of the judiciary, what do you all think about uh, pretrial conditions, bond conditions? Um, let's, say for your, let's say for a DWI, uh, what are your thoughts on interlocks? Uh, let's say, for, and also for assault family members, we hear a lot about the no contacts and magistrate's orders for emergency protection. What are your views and standpoints on those? Sure. I have a very short answer. I'll go ahead and take this one. Um, the law of the land is that people are presumed innocent un unless proven guilty or unless they plead guilty. And it's always been my view that bond conditions are a way to punish people before they're proven guilty or before they're found guilty, et cetera. Um, for the most part, I oppose bond conditions because what we're doing is we're disregarding the Constitution of the United States, which is innocent unless proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And we're punishing these people. I had a client, uh, just really quick, <coughs> He was a, a DWI client, like you say. He was poor. Uh, he had to get an interlock installed. But when his blood came back, he was 0 .000. And then the prosecutor was still not satisfied, made him get an interlock while the uh, came back for toxicology. Blood came back, zero drugs, zero everything. 
And this person was a person on food stamps and it caused a very great hardship for him to put that interlock on for the four or five months while we waited for blood results. And it really changed his lifestyle. It really did. It, it, it put him in a much worse situation. And um, I fought the judge and she still ordered the interlock. And, and I, I've just, I've seen it. I've seen it. What are y'all's opinions on interlocks and uh, to follow up magistrate's orders for emergency protection and no contacts? Uh, no contacts? I, for the most part, and with Armin to a certain degree, I do oppose them, but I also believe that they are also necessary for the two-prong system that um, David was talking about, which I do somewhat agree with also, that it is a two-prong system that's been developed over time. I know it's not written in the Constitution, but it's been developed over time that it's also a safety function for the community. And if a person calls as saying that they were assaulted, magistrate's order for protection is imposed, I mean, the last thing you want is while they're out of your court, when the alleged victim requested um, a MOAP and they didn't receive one and then they end up getting hurt or something worse ends up happening to them, I do believe that you do have to protect them to a certain degree. I'm not in no way saying that they're guilty or anything like that because they are presumed innocent until they are proven guilty. But at the same time, um, when it's requested by an accused, for some reason or another, the call was made, the police were involved. Um, we don't know the facts, but if it's requested, I think at the very least we can do that. No contact orders, I think, are a bit much, but MOAPs at the request of proven up by the uh, alleged victim, uh, I'm in favor of them. I really Complaining am. with us. Yeah. Uh, are you, uh, magistrate's orders for emergency protection are judges' orders that prohibits certain conduct, con, uh, conduct between a, a defendant and a complaining witness uh, and prohibits certain conduct from the defendant from doing or, or traveling to. Um, do you, magistrate's orders for emergency protections are the norm. You, you prefaced it and you, and you uh, asterisked it with uh, magistrate's order for emergency protections when, per, uh, when the complaining witness asks for them. Correct. But it seems like I mean, they're the norm, so they get the MOEP before that request is made. What are your thoughts on that? And I think that that is, I think that's a big problem. I think that, you know, uh, an order of protection is something that it should be requested and should be, they talk to the victim, the alleged victim, and make sure that they want them. What I see happening additionally is that they order these MOEPs, this magistrate's order for emergency protection, without even talking to the victim. Right. So the DAs will go ahead and on their own request this. Now what I've seen, good things happen. I've seen judges say, hey, did you talk to the, uh, the victim? And judges will say, well, yeah, uh, we talked to them and they requested, okay. In that instance, it gets ordered. And I've also seen it the, the opposite, where they say, no, we haven't talked to them. And it still gets entered and it shouldn't. And in that instance, it shouldn't, but I've seen they do, them do it anyways, and I think that's wrong. It needs to change. But I've also seen judges do the right thing as well. I've seen judges, you know, now sitting judges on the bench say, well, you haven't talked to them. Why are you requesting this? Which is, which is the right thing to do. What are y'all's positions on interlocks? And Armin has mentioned it, but what about y'all's position on interlocks? And we know DWI seconds, here they come, but uh, let's say a DWI first. What, what, are, y what are your positions on interlocks as, as in general? Uh, I guess b breath or blood case, I guess it depends because by statutory, if it's over a .15 when they blow, I mean, right. it's kind of out of our power. Right. It, they need to have one. But while the blood is pending, when we're waiting for the toxicology report to come in, I personally think it's unnecessary at that point because we don't know anything yet at that point. Mm -hmm. I'm, in, I'm in agreement, yeah. Wow. What about alternative um, pretrial supervisions? Are y'all open to that? You know, for example, uh, I heard uh, Judge Fields in court the other day ordering a patch on somebody, for example, or other judges order ankle monitors. Occasionally, I've heard other judges consider home confinement and curfews for misdemeanors. We see this routinely on felonies. We see this home confinement, ankle monitors, things like that. But for misdemeanors, what are your thoughts on alternative with uh, pretrial supervision things? Are those something that you all would consider or even thought about? And what is your position on that? Again, absolutely not. Uh, we're punishing the innocent before they're proven guilty. So these alternative pretrial bond conditions are absolutely ridiculous. They're, 
the judges are ignoring the Constitution. They're not following the law. 15 out of 16 of them in particular just do not follow the law on a daily basis, and it's wrong. It's That's amazing. Well, I mean, that you know, it's so crazy that uh, I think we brought it up on the show once before that things that seem right are so wild <laughs> in Harris County. Like, the things that seem <coughs> like actually should happen uh, under the law and, and what our system believes in and is founded upon is, is ludicrous and to hear in Harris County. However, uh, going back to uh, what Aaron and, and David were saying, those are things that have now, been developed. And I mean, what are your thoughts on well, it? Well, understand, you know, one of the issues when as candidates running for judge, we cannot tell you how we would rule on a specific right, issue. Right. I'm not allowed to do that. I can't right, tell you. Right. So don't call but, in with those questions, ladies so, and gentlemen. Don't right. ask I can't, them how they would rule on a specific issue. I can't tell you issue. how I would rule on a specific right. subject, yeah. but I'll tell you that, um, you know, I would take everything into consideration, and I, I think that, you know, an ankle monitor, that's... A little excessive. In the, right. <laughs> I mean, so what's your stance on ankle monitors? What would you... I mean, I, I, ankle I, monitors I, are used when people patch, are at risk of flight, maybe. I, I, <laughs> you know, if, you, if, you, if you suspect that the person is not going to... For a trespass? I mean... Yeah. A, an, a patch? I've never seen a patch. Yeah, I, I saw a patch. What, like a nicotine patch? Uh, no, a drug patch. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I've seen it, too. Yeah. Fields is handing out the drug patches. He loves the scram, the yes. scram unit. I mean, everyone in his court yeah. that goes through, you know, drug or alcohol offense, he orders a scram on it, and that's well. Just... And these devices, they're so, they're so unreliable. That's, and I was yeah. just going to get they, to that. I mean, they, and how? I mean, it's run by the fuel cell technology. How? How? I once had a, a, a case over in federal court where my client was on a GPS monitoring because, <laughs> you know, they, they they viewed him as a risk of flight. And we went over because we were having problems with the GPS monitoring equipment. And this was, granted, this was 12, 10, Latest 12 technology. years ago. So it wasn't exactly, we weren't on the cutting edge <laughs> right. of, of GPS technology at that point. I mean, it looked like he was carrying around the old brick, you know, cell phones uh, that you used to have. But, but one time we're sitting in the federal courthouse and because we were having problems with the monitor going off. And the, the, the preacher officer says, computer, huh, well, that's weird. It says you're in Nome, Alaska, but you're sitting right in front of me. There's no way you can be in Nome, Alaska. I mean, and I have a problem. I have a problem with that. I mean, you know, if we're going to order something onto someone, we need to make sure that it's reliable. Yeah. You know, especially if, if you're making them pay, you know, the scram. I mean, that's very expensive. And then for it to not I mean, be reliable and right. keep what are you, going what are you paying like four hundred dollars a month to be monitored? That's 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 when you're innocent and indigent yeah. and or presumed indigent. and presumed innocent. Right. Uh, we're close enough to 8.30. Let's go ahead and open up the phone lines. If you guys want to call in, 713-807-1794 is the number for a talks with Armin, Aaron, and David, the three county court at criminal court at law number five candidates on the Democratic side uh, seeking the nomination. I also got Twitter up at HCCLA underscore TV. Um, one of the things that I want to ask you guys, there has been since... Uh, I guess really since our new DA took office, but even going back to our last DA, a couple judges, the, the number of judges have, have grown with our new DA coming into office that, that want to eh, deny people the right to enter into a pretrial uh, intervention <laughs> Jimmy, with, uh, with the yes. district attorney's office. That, that, <clears throat> um, and so I, you know, the DA's office right now, um, for those who don't know, the way a pretrial intervention or a pretrial diversion works in Harris County is it's a contract with the state. And right now those are currently supervised by the probation department. Uh, and essentially what happens is the case gets carried for the year long period. It gets carried on the court's docket until the person has fulfilled the terms and conditions of the contract with the DA's office. What's been happening lately is some judges do not want to carry uh, that case for a year, um, or for whatever other reasons they might have, um, be that as it may. But that seems to be the outwardly stated reason. They don't want to carry it. It's clogging up dockets, that sort of thing. Um, <coughs> so setting aside that the DA's office could do their own thing by dismissing the case and not carrying it, I I'm wondering from each of y'all, what, what is y'all's position with regard to whether or not the judge, a judge should be interfering in a pretrial diversion situation? 
Jimmy, I'm... I, you're jumping at the bit. I'm, 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 yeah, I'm so glad you brought this question up. This is I mean, actually... You're about to tackle the camera. Uh, <laughs> this is actually the reason why I chose Court 5 to run for as a bench. And this is before I knew that the current tyrant judge, Margaret Harris, was retiring. Um, I had a client who, uh, again, accused of DWI. He was a, a great candidate that I thought for a pretrial diversion. Um, he was a, an English teacher, AP English teacher up in the Kingwood area, a uh, terrific guy. And because there was an accident involved, she blocked the DA from even evaluating him to see if he would be a good candidate or not. Now, like you just mentioned, the pretrial diversion, it's a contract between the DA's office and the accused. And if the accused fulfills the contract, then the case is dismissed. And of course, there are several factors that go into it to make sure that that, is the, that should be the right resolution. But to go in there and block, she is overstepping her boundaries. And a lot of these judges now, that's what I mean by they're, they're not following the law. They're overstepping their boundaries. Instead of playing the judiciary, they're starting to play the executive branch. Right. If they wanted to continue to prosecute, they should have never left the DA's office and ran for judge. Well, and the distinction, it, it, while it's an agreement with the state, it's not a plea agreement with the Correct. state because you're not pleading. And so... Uh, you know, the judge, although if, 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 if as a judge they came to you and said, well, we want to give this plea offer, the judge could then reject the plea offer. Correct. Uh, they, under the, under the Code of Criminal Procedure, the judge has the authority to say, no, I'm not following that agreement. Correct. Um, but, but, but this is not a plea agreement wherein no. the defendant's entering a guilty plea. So uh, what basis do they have to do this? They don't. Uh, uh, let me ask you, what I, yeah. see, what I see happening a lot is, you know, uh, like in DWIs, you know, and what I've seen with several courts happen is where they have people evaluated and they look to see what their risk level is. If they are medium risk, if they're high risk, no dice. I don't know. I yeah, uh, if it were up to me, I mean, basically, at that point, um, as Jimmy was saying, like the Biggest issue is potentially carrying it over for a year or six months, however l length the term of the contract may be. I mean, I would. But just, why is that the judge's problem? Uh, I, I would sign the reset. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, mean, I, I, mean, I, I, uh, I mean, just leave it on the docket, and there are certain terms of the contract they have to abide by. And should the uh, should a, a defendant fail to complete their terms of the contract, then it comes right back in the docket. But normally as part of the contract to even get in, you have to prepare some kind of packet which requires them to admit to certain things anyway. So I think one way or another, it's still going to end up getting resolved when it, whether it comes back for a dismissal or it comes back because they felt something because they have already signed a waiver of admission. Mm -hmm. Aaron, what is your, and to the panel, what, is, what are y'all's opinion as to the role of a judge in pretrial proceedings? They shouldn't be involved at all. It is a direct contract between the DA's office and the accused. Outside of pretrial interventions though too, as a general principle, what role should the judge play pretrial? <clears throat> I'll tell you, okay. Yeah. yeah. I think the judge uh, should make sure that the DA is not withholding evidence, that they're not hiding things. There are certain things, uh, such as CPS records, if there's some mitigation or exculpatory things in there, to view in camera and make sure that it does get turned over because those things are not automatic, right? So uh, the judge should ensure that the accused gets a fair trial because that's what it says in the Sixth Amendment of the United States Constitution. What do you think? Um, I couldn't agree more. I mean, uh, and I think a judge should somewhat step back. And I wouldn't be opposed to longer resets to allow the district attorney to do their job and speak with the defense lawyers and even waiving defendants' appearances so long as their attorneys are there in an effort to exchange evidence among each other to make sure it's all being done. Would you guys, would any of you guys consider just doing a scheduling order rather than the traditional reset system that we have? Well, I have... In, in that, in let's say you, you, you do what they do on the civil side, for instance, in county court over there, when a lawsuit's filed, the initial trial date is 180 days out from that. And you have deadlines that are automatically set by the court for discovery and other things in there. Why can't that be done on the criminal side in county court? Well, why does it have to? Why can't I trust, I, I would trust a lawyer to do 
what they need to do. Sure, but why, I mean, why? Well, I but mean, because, you know, but 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 don't don't we all need deadlines uh, uh, to to comply with by? I mean, in, to say to the DA's office, you need to have all discovery turned over ninety days from the date <coughs> you bring this charge. If discovery anything that is not turned over by ninety days, you, you know, you could put <coughs> your order and say. If anything, if you don't turn over anything, guess what? You ain't using it at trial state, so you better have everything turned over. <coughs> and if you want to use it and it's past the 90 days, you better show me good cause. Mm -hmm. It's a court order, right? You can do whatever you want as a judge. I mean, you can set those things. And so I'm just wondering, It's nobody seems to want to do it because they all want to give the state the benefit of the doubt on things. And nobody wants to, everybody wants to hold defense lawyers accountable and the defendants accountable by putting them on pre-trial conditions and doing this and, and, and man, we want a, a, a boatload of accountability over on the defense side. But there is zero accountability on the state side. Yeah. And I'm, I'm talking and not just about Brady, not just about handing over exculpatory evidence. I'm talking about just meeting deadlines, filing notices, giving notice of experts, giving notice of, you know, other 404B, other crimes, wrongs, and acts that you want, you intend to introduce. <coughs> I mean, those types of ministerial things are not getting done and nobody is being held accountable for it. And we get sandbagged. The defense, it's, it's trial by ambush in a lot of cases and it's, eh, you want a continuance? I'll give you one. Well, that, that doesn't remedy it for me. I shouldn't have to get a continuance. My client's trial shouldn't have to be continued another 90 days because the state over here decided to wait till a week before trial or two days before trial to hand me over all this stuff. I, I don't know the answer to your question, quite honestly. <laughs> really, I, I don't. I mean, I guess it's, but as a judge, it's, you'd trial, have that power. it's yeah. trial and error. You see, okay, well, let's try it this way. Does it work this way? Can I trust the lawyers to work well by themselves, do how we've had it for the last, you know, for me, 13, 14 years? You know, if, if not, if it doesn't work well, then you always have the ability to do a scheduling order, you know? Are y'all, y'all think y'all have the <clears throat> guts to hold the state to the their feet to the fire? Absolutely. You think so? Without a doubt. Oh, oh man, I don't know, doubt, man. That's mind. politics. Without a doubt. Hey, state not, state, not ready. You're going to sign that? You're going to say, well, we're going anyways? Yes. Absolutely. Woo I'm going to hold y'all to that. I hope man. you do. I hope you do. Because, like I said before, the, the, the Sixth Amendment to, to the United States Constitution does not guarantee the government get a, fa uh, get a fair trial. It guarantees that the accused get a fair trial. That is the law of the land, and I intend to follow the law. Do, do you guys think it's fair that that the dispositive motion hearing is very rarely used, and that if you have a motion to suppress or any other pretrial motion, it's just carried with trial? I will. Uh, I've thought about this. I will hear all motions pretrial. Uh, it, it's up to uh, the accused and their lawyer if they think that's best. Then and, yeah, I'll hear pretrial. In my pre experience, that's something that's usually raised by a defense lawyer and their client. And for that, you have to you have to know the judge, and know that they would uh, follow the law. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I'd have no issues hearing any and all motions that they want to bring pretrial. If they're going to be dispositive, try to resolve the case. If they only have one specific issue that they feel strong about, <coughs> let's hear it. And and it's going to get it taken care of. Let's talk about bond forfeiting. So we've talked about pre-trial bonds, <coughs> unsecured bonds. We've talked about um, pre-trial conditions. 832. <laughs> it's 832. Dockets at 830. State moves for bond forfeiture. <laughs> Granted, is that how it's going to be? What's y'all's position on that? Well, JV, I'm glad you brought this question up. This is one of my main issues that I'm running for judge as. Um, as judge, once an accused has a lawyer, he or she will not be required to show up to my court until and unless it's time for trial, time to plea, or a contested motion where their testimony might be necessary. That is the only time they are going to be required to show up. Why are we punishing the good, hardworking citizens of Harris County before they plead guilty to anything? They're coming in, they're <coughs> wasting half a day just signing a reset. For what? And this happened six, seven, eight times. And I've done the numbers. I've run the numbers. So if I may, the average Harris County citizen makes $35,000 a year. If you break that down into hourly wage, it's $17.50 an hour. Now, at best, they will be able to take a half a day where they only lose $70 from their paycheck, right? You multiply 70 times 60, which is generally the number of people on any given docket, 
that's $4,200. You multiply $4,200 times 250, which is the number of days they hold docket, that's over a million dollars wasted in productivity in Harris County. And that's just for one county court. We have 16. So we are forcing the, the good people of Harris County to waste $16 million plus in productivity by requiring them to show up for what? The lawyers should still come in. They need to talk to the prosecutor. They need to move the case along. And I'm gonna hold the lawyers to that, like David is, or like Aaron will. But why are we forcing the good people of Harris County, especially when all the courts are displaced right now? It's, it's just absolutely unacceptable. There's one elevator working right now. Yeah, what, are y what are your thoughts? Parking will be easy, right? Yeah, yeah no kidding, <laughs> It'll right? be easy to get parking. <laughs> What's your position, Aaron? Um, so, so long as they're there for their arraignment, so I know, uh, so I know what's going to be going on. After that, I have no issues waiving the defendant's appearance because they understand I need to work, and regardless of what the outcome of the case may be, if it involves some kind of plea deal later, they're going to need their job. If it ends up in a probation, they're going to need to be paying things. They have other engagements to attend to outside of this potential error that was made or wasn't made. We don't know yet at that point. And I, I've been thinking a lot here for the past 10 minutes ever since Jimmy brought up the scheduling order. I think that's something that could actually help in that regards. Maybe 90, 90 days or 120 days on the blood cases where it takes longer to get the blood cases back. Uh, issue a scheduling order that the lawyers need to come back on that day to receive the evidence. Then, then sometime after that, have the client come in and see if we can reach some kind of resolution. Let me, let me ask you, I know that judges have attempted to do this in the past. I know that Fields at one point was doing this. If you remember a couple years mm -hmm. ago, he did that where he would set people off for months, months, months. Yeah. months. Yeah. I remember. What happened? I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, you can't <clears throat> just, to me, you can't just commit, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. Can't, can't. Everything is done by trial and error. You got to see what works, got to see what doesn't work, and then you make an informed decision at that point. So why did Fields, why did it not work for Fields? I don't know. I mean, that's something that, you know, if we get elected, I think that that's, you know, what a, one of our jobs is to really go to prior judges and, and ask them and look wholeheartedly, I, I'm, why did it not work? Mm -hmm. Tell me. You know, I, I'm trying to make life easier for not only you know, people accused, mm -hmm. DAs, defense attorneys, everybody, we can have a cohesive system. Why did it not work? So, I mean, I, I know that you're saying about the <coughs> question you just asked, but I mean, I, I, w I can't commit to anything until I learn why, what worked, what didn't it, why didn't it work, and, and let, me, let me figure out what does work to kind of... Uh... What are y'all's positions on judges intervening in plea deals? What do you also, what's your position on that? Well, I mean, they have the, they have the right to do that. They can do that. I don't know whether they should. That's where I'm going. I mean, I mean should I can't, they? What's, I can't. Your, what's your position on I mean, do you have, uh, do you all have a, a man's got to have a code, as I've heard on you, them. I mean, you, <laughs> can't, you can't do that, though. You can't make that kind of... I don't know. I think I can. I think I can say as a judge, I'm not going to be messing around. If y'all, the state and the, you have an agreement, I'm not going to be coming in and busting pleas. But wouldn't it just I think I can say that. type of case, too? Say? But wouldn't it depend on the type of case? Right, and that's I mean, what I was just about to say. It depends on the case. It depends on the person. It depends on what does, the, what does the victim want. So I think these are all things that you take into consideration to make, you know. Well, because, I mean, I've seen it go both ways. I mean, it, it, you know, obviously, more often than not, it, it is the judge saying, hmm, that plea deal is a little too lenient. I don't, I don't think you <laughs> Right, right. That. It's never the other I mean, that, that, that clearly <laughs> happens more often than not. But, uh, but there are the occasional case where the judge does have reservations about, should this guy even be taking this deal in the first place, you know, and, and about whether or not they've been properly counseled to even get that? I mean, I, I have seen judges in the past who have actually instructed. Uh, I, 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 you know, I do a lot of appointments, and I did appointments with Derbs for a long time in, in Court 7, and I've seen her do that. Yeah. I've seen her go, well, what's, what's going on? Why are you doing this? You know, which is which is refreshing. You know, yeah. it's it's something that's nice and, and um, it's it's good. We got our first call of the night. Let's jump over to the phone lines and uh, really test you. Derbyshire, guys Judge Derbyshire. Yeah, it's I knew the it was the so, so that everybody else knows <laughs> that else. I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, hello, Ooh. thank you for calling Reasonable Doubt. Yeah, I was wondering if each of the guests, uh, the candidates, could. 
say one thing that they think has gone well since Hurricane Harvey and the, ju- the judicial response to it, moving courthouses and things like that, and one thing that they think has not gone well uh, and what they would have done differently on the thing that would have not gone, that they did not do well. Great Thanks. question. Thanks for the call. Armin, we'll start with you. Okay, great. Because um, your name begins with an A, so why not start with So does his. He, he's got two A's. <laughs> yeah, you're, a. Right the, you're right to the left. A-A-Ron. 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 Yeah. You're right to the left. You're right to the left of me. Okay. Um, <laughs> we'll just go around So the table. I, think, I think one thing that's gone pretty well is that everyone's kind of been a team player, uh, the DAs, the defense lawyers. No one's really getting on each other's back about certain things. We know that sometimes... Uh, files are being uh, misplaced and files are being lost and uh, as a defense lawyer I've been pretty patient with uh, with a lot of my cases because I, I know the situation they're in 10 different buildings I get it uh, one bad thing is we ask the judges to waive pretrial appearances and they still refuse to do so and it would just alleviate so many problems if they did and they're not doing it and it, it's just unacceptable it's unacceptable to me and I don't know why they continue to require people there at 830 when there's only one working elevator and not very much parking and in a courthouse where people have never been to and don't know it's unacceptable. Aaron? Um, I have to agree with him on the whole team player just seeing everybody together and being more understanding I think it I guess as the city as a whole as it grew together I think the the courthouse family whether you're a judge, a defense lawyer, a prosecutor, brought everybody closer together and at least brought a sense of understanding to one another. Um, something that I think could have been handled differently, but I'm not sure how they could have done it better. Um, I do a lot of appointments, as does David. Um, it's difficult um, the way you're assigned and you can get transferred. Um, the way it works is you're working out of one court and then you go over to the jail and you can get appointed cases out of every other court. Um, but then with all the PR bonds that we discussed earlier in the segment and unsecured bonds, if they get released or if they make bond, then you're kind of stuck with them and then you're running back and forth, back and forth. I know, JV, you run into this issue too. Um, I'm not sure how that could have been handled better, but I'm sure that it could have been handled a little bit better. I know that's one issue that a lot of people have run into, but I guess the understanding, the good part, is it's still somewhat working, making the best of a bad situation. David? It's funny that, you know, um, we've all been working in the building for a long time. We all complain, moan, yell, these darn elevators at 1201, and now the experience, now we're like, oh, man, we had it great. (laughs) I've never wanted to go back and 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 now so bad. You know, (laughs) the grass is always green, and um, I... I've had a different experience from Armin. I think that the judges that we've had now, they've really gone above and beyond to really kind of help us out. If, if my guy really needs time, more time, I think that we've, we've basically gotten it. I think that, you know, the good thing is that um, everybody's really been able to help each other out as far as, you know, because there's staggered dockets everywhere. So for most, you know, the judges are pretty understanding about, you know, the dress isn't as as strict as it is. You know, the timing isn't as strict as it is. I mean, now we're starting to get back into the norm of things. I think logistically it's difficult with what we're dealing with. And I think the bad part is, is that we're still dealing with it. But, I mean, it's, it's a consequence that we're going to be dealing with for the next year, year and a half. <laughs> but I think that we're slowly, we're getting back to it. And... I think we're all going to be very happy when we get back to 1201, that's for sure. You know what I'm amazed by? Hmm. Mm. How quickly we got jury trials back. Yeah. And, and, I, I, and, it, that it's function- and not only that we have them on the criminal side, but we have them on the civil side. We have, we have essentially got to the point where if you want a jury, you're, you're going to get to a jury. And, 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 I mean, there were horror stories. We were thinking... 2018. Yeah. Oh, well, no. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were thinking, yeah. Hey, you mean 2019? Yeah, 2018. <laughs> I mean, we were thinking April right, yeah. on before actually right. getting a jury trial. But I think I mean, Justin Harris won the first jury trial at the gate of Harvey. Isn't that right? <laughs> I don't know. I think so. <laughs> He's giving us the thumbs up. He's but good, I, yeah. But I think that's the, the really good thing. we got another call coming on the line, so let's jump over. Hello. Thanks for calling Reasonable Doubt. Hi. Um, I'd like to hear each candidate's plans of what they're going to do to raise the standard for indigent defense in Harris County. Great. Thanks for the question, guys. Great question. <coughs> I'll start it off. So, um, 
As far as indigent defense, this is something that's very near and dear to my heart. I am a graduate of Gideon's Promise, which is the foremost uh, training for indigent defense lawyers nationwide. Um, one thing we need to do is look, the Texas Indigent Defense Commission has already, has all this great material that's out there. It's published, it's out there, it's public knowledge. And um, we need to just follow those because it says that the recommended caseload should be 179 misdemeanors a year. And David, I hate to call you out, but I looked you up, man, and you had 574 cases in 2016. That's a lot. Now, I'm not calling you out because, look, the judges are the ones appointing you, right? So the judges need to do a much better job of talking to each other and seeing how many appointments they're giving to the lawyers that are on the list and making sure the, 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 it's getting spread evenly. Because I don't know how you can be effective when you have so many cases. You know, it's, it's a lot of meet and plead. And again, I hate, I don't, I'm not trying to throw you under the bus. Uh, you know, you got paid on those 574, you got paid $64,400. I want you to get paid $64,400, but taking 179 cases and investigating the facts more and investigating the law more and and uh, building more mitigation for your clients, doing it that way, putting more out of court hours and still making the same amount of money than the old traditional meet and plead that we know of. What are your thoughts? Well, part of it, following those guidelines and then I think um, allowing more people on personal bonds and more people on unsecured bonds out is allowing attorneys to do a better job because I do a ton of appointments in Harris County as does David, as do you, JV. And look, when, they're, when they're incarcerated, when they're still in jail, it's very difficult to say, hey, can I reset you a week or two? You're going to be here, but I think there's an issue. Let me watch the body cam. Let, let me make sure there's links or whatever it may be. Uh, let me take a look at it. Um, but they also have a duty to relay every offer that's presented to them. And this, or you can take 10 days and you'll be out today. Uh, yeah. Um, so I do think letting them out is a, allowing, allowing attorneys who represent injured defendants to do a better job and represent them in a more effective way. I, like you, have quite a few DWIs and assaults, the more serious misdemeanors that are over there lined up for trial for the same reasons. I mean, there's investigation to be done, there's work to be done, and it's much easier to allow the attorneys to do the work when they're out. What are your thoughts on uh, pro providing experts or experts or investigators? That's, um, that's something that um, is almost, not quite, but almost unheard of in the misdemeanor realm, judges providing funds decent amount of funds to a defense attorney or to a defense to effectively represent people in regards to investigator fees or DWI <coughs> fees, uh, not DWI fees, um, expert fees. I say DWIs because that's something that that's part of the majority of what <coughs> misdemeanors would be. I mean, do you think there's enough money for all of that? Sure. Do you think, um, and is that something that could happen? I mean, like, for example, if we have 20 DWIs and each of them, we want our own blood expert reviewed. I mean, is that, so, and I mean, obviously I guess you'd have to make a, a, a prima facie case that it's, it's, it's required or something that could help you, help the defense. Um, I think that could be easily made in most cases, but is that something, what's y'all's position on that? Yeah. I think it'd be on a case by case basis. They definitely wouldn't be denied outright, but it also depends on the defense lawyer themselves, whether they're going to be willing and able to approach it. But I right. think I, along with either one of these two guys, would more than be more than willing to at least hear the reasons as to why and wouldn't outright deny anything like that. For me, if you ask for it, JV, you're going to get it because I know that if they're looking at a 200-day wreck for some assault family violence and you're asking me for an investigator and I can pay the investigator 1500 bucks to go find out what really happened and maybe the 200-day offer turns into a 20-day offer or just flat out gets dismissed, we're saving money right. on the back end. It costs more than $100 a day to house someone in Harris right. County Jail. Ask Adrian Garcia that. He'll tell you. So sometimes it's worth investing money up front and you know ensuring that the accused gets that fair trial gets just gets everything they that a rich person would get and we still get justice at the end and it doesn't cost us any more than it would have otherwise I, agree. I absolutely agree i think that that's something that if a defense needs an expert 
for whatever they think. I well, think that that's something that's, that's <clears throat> absolutely, um, that should be taken into consideration. Yeah, we got a question coming yep. on Twitter that I want to get you guys to answer uh, before we get out of here, and that is, what will you do to be accountable to crime victims in Harris County? David, you want to lead it off? Sorry, say it again. What will you do to be accountable to crime victims in Harris County? Well, what you want to do, accountability, is take them into consideration. Ask them, hey, what do you think? And I think that the district attorney's office does that now. Whenever, they, whenever there's a crime, when a person's charged with a crime where there's a victim, one of the first things that they do is they talk to that victim and they say, hey, what happened? What's your side of the story? Were there any injuries? Did you go to the hospital? And that's one of the things that happens right now as, as in any case where there's a victim. And I think that that's <clears throat> one of the ways that they can get accountability and make sure that the victim is taken into account. Aaron? That's precisely right. One of the first things that they do, um, even now, we often get resets because they need a, they call it a rip call when they contact the complaining witness. Uh, take into account, find out what exactly they're saying, um, what they think is reasonable in terms of how they're feeling about the case and how they wanted to proceed. I mean, just take into consideration what their opinions are because they're the ones who made the call in the first place. Armin? Yeah. So, uh, to me, I hate that word victim because it presumes that a crime has been committed. So I like to say complaining witness. Now, if there is a complaining witness in the case, and let's be honest, in most misdemeanors, there aren't, unless it's an assault case or failure to stop and give information. But, I mean, DWIs, no victim. PCS, no victim. <coughs> complaining witness, complaining witness. Um, so... It's the DA's job to make sure that the complaining witness, if there is one, is made whole. And they can do that by offering deals to the defense lawyer or the accused where, hey, pay us back the money uh, for the broken window and we'll dump this case. Or we'll give you a probation instead of sending your guy to jail for 90 days. So the, it's, it's the DA's job to take care of the complaining witnesses. It's the judge's job to make sure that the accused gets a fair trial. Again, it's not really their place to worry about the complaining witness. That is the DA's job, and I can't stress that enough. Court five, what's the one thing that each of you individually on your, can bring to that bench and to the system uh, that's unique to each of you? And you gotta hustle quickly, because we only got a minute Aaron. left. Uh, um I'm firm here. I grew up here. I know the citizens of the county, and I think I can reflect with them on a personal basis. How about you, Dave? What I can bring, I think I can bring compassion, fairness, equality, and I think that what's most important is to let everybody have a fair shake, you know? Um, I can bring diversity to the background. I uh, was not born in the United States. I was born in Canada. I went through the immigration process. In fact, I brought my, uh, my citizenship certificate to show off. Um, this is something I'm I very proud of. Yeah. yeah, yeah, back in 2010. <laughs> I was, yeah, sworn in uh, Houston, Texas, June 16th, 2010. One of the proudest days of my life. And I know what it's like to be an illegal alien because I was here six years undocumented while we were waiting for my green card to issue. I know what it's like to have a green card for 10 years. I have those experiences. I've been a dishwasher at restaurants. I've been a teacher, a track coach, a cross country coach. And these have all made me, uh, I, I, and I think I'm the only former prosecutor here. So I've, I've actually seen both sides. Uh, I think I would bring great diversity and wisdom and experience to the bench. And on that note, that's all the time we got, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank Armin Merjanian, Aaron Saldana, and David Fleischer for joining us tonight and talking about all the issues. And I uh, wish you all luck in the upcoming primary. Thank you, Jimmy. We'll, we'll see one of you back here after the primary. <laughs> uh, so best of luck. Uh, for Julio Vela, I'm Jimmy Ardwan. We'll see you all next week with another new episode of Reasonable Doubt. Good night. <laughs>